going to continue in the theme of Stranger Places. You guys know what I'm talking about, Stranger Places, close enough to Stranger Things. Just want to make sure we're all on the same page. Um, and in that theme, I'm going to ask you to take out your cell phone and you go, that is strange. Um, and I'm going to ask you who are on Facebook to check in. And for those of you that are going, um, I, don't, I don't love that thought or I don't have Facebook, just humor the rest of us for just a minute. You guys check in with me? Come on, let's check in. I'm going to do it. And I don't even need my kids here to help me. I can do it by my own self. Okay. For those of us that said, I'm glad that's over with, now let's get on to something that's really important and matters, um, I would like to uh, take just a moment to check in with God. Now let's do that. Lord, we want to thank you for your goodness in our lives, and as was mentioned by one of the teens, uh, we have a lot of stuff, a lot of stuff going on. And uh, so we want to uh, acknowledge that you're aware of all of that, and we want to commit it to you and ask that as we open up the scripture that we would hear your voice and that you would have free course to change our lives. And we pray this for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. We've been going through Hebrews chapter 11 and the theme of verses 13 through 16, which we're going to look at in just a minute. But I wanted to draw your attention to the photo on the screen. And, you know, I want you to think about relationships. And here we have a divide, and it's interesting because if you look at the postures of the people that are involved here, you can almost get a few things. Uh, you see the people that are on, would be your right, I guess, that uh, the person, and, and they've, they've obviously got their arms crossed. And you see the people that are on the left, and it looks like the one guy maybe just has his hands in his pockets, like maybe he doesn't care. Maybe his hands are on his hips, I can't tell exactly, but he's got it. He's got somebody else with him who's probably saying, yeah, there's a good reason for this divide. Because we do that sometimes in relationship divides. We get people to affirm that it's okay to be on our side. And it's okay that they're not on our side. And I want to mention, as I s said last week, that life is all about relationships. Read through the scriptures. It's about relationships. It's first and foremost about our relationship with Jesus, and really it's the most important question that could ever be asked to, who, to you, who is Jesus? Uh, it's, the, it's the most important question we'll ever have to ask, what will you do with Jesus? Uh, but, but all other uh, relationships are at a premium in God's economy as well. Life is all about relationships, and a right relationship involves I wrote down a few things here that a right relationship involves. Trust, commitment, respect, sacrifice, forgiveness. Oh wait, don't go that far. Love. I wasn't trying to put together an exhaustive list, but a right relationship has these components to it, doesn't it? You've got a really good friend and, and there's even been some kind of issue that's come up with there. There's enough trust. There's enough commitment. There's enough sacrifice and, and forgiveness that love will win, right? You don't have a right relationship and we begin to experience things like disappointment, frustration, offense, betrayal. And the signs of a relationship that's not right are all too familiar to us, right? Remember, I've got the theme here of stranger places, and yes, we're going to be going kicking and screaming into the relationship stranger place today. But, but we're used to relationships on our terms, and we're familiar with what happens in a strained or broken relationship. We're familiar with the experience of discomfort it's hard to be in the same room. 
We can't make eye contact when we're in the same room. We avoid. And sometimes we justify that and say, for my own health, I have to avoid that person. I remember in high school, um, there were a group of us, we were not a clique, but there were a group of us, and uh, there were some people that got along better with others, and I remember Jill saying about Mark, and if either of them were here, they would laugh. But I remember Jill saying, I can only take Mark in small doses. And when a relationship is fractured, people hide like Adam and Eve. People harbor resentments. People justify unforgiveness. And people begin to hate. Hatred, like the kind of anger Jesus said was tantamount to murder. And by the way, we can do that with each other. We're familiar with that. And we can do that with God. Uh, I forget the lyrics, but a really great song about uh, marching around the walls and not seeing anything happening for a while. Uh, if you didn't get that, that was a reference to Jericho where we all, wait a minute, I did my seven laps. It should be that the walls came down. I've been waiting, Lord, for this to happen. It should be that it, 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 Lord, I've trusted you for this issue, and as far as I'm concerned, there's been enough time here for you to work. I want to share just one story and get right back to the text that we looked at last week. And this is the story of Tom. And Rich, you're going to know this one because uh, there, Rich has been part of the Bible study that we've had for a long, long time. And then now then went off and, and they've got a, now a Bible study, a, a life group in their home, which is really great. Except for I wish you were still with us. But anyway, um, uh, there was a guy who came one time to the Bible study and we didn't know him, but uh, he was playing in the church rec league. Now, uh, we had a men's league for basketball, and I never played in that because I don't have any basketball skills at all. Uh, but uh, Tom is his name, and Tom came to our Bible study because one of the guys from our Bible study said, hey, you should come to the Bible study sometime, and Tom came. I don't know why he came. I don't know how our invitations work. I wish everybody had responded to all of our invitations, don't you? And it seems like hardly ever do people do, but Tom came. And uh, it was interesting. We didn't know any of this about Tom, uh, but came to find out later. Tom had um, given his life to Christ when he was a teenager, but somewhere along the path, he kind of got it mixed up with the American dream and a few other things that he thought were going to be fine with, with God and turned out not to be. And along the path, he got into an argument with his parents who were believers, and he stopped talking to them as a young adult. And then Tom began to have a family at a, at a marriage and, and kids, young boys, and um, somewhere along the way in that uh, marriage that he thought would be perfect, there were regretful behaviors and it was not going well. It was strained at best. And he was playing in a basketball league. He came to the Bible study, and we were studying, I think, Romans at the time. I can't remember. Whatever it was, we were taking way too long in every section of verses. But, uh, but God was speaking, and God was showing up, and we didn't know any of the things that... Listen, we all have things in our lives, don't we? And you meet people, they have stuff, too. They have their stuff. And after a couple Bible studies, Tom asked Rich and I if he could talk with us. I'm going to leave it right there for right now. You say that's not fair, but that's where I'm going to leave it. Hebrews 11, verses 13 through 16 says this. All these people, and we're referring to, we've talked about uh, in the scripture before that, these people were Abel and Enoch, uh, Noah and Abraham and Sarah. All these people were living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance, admitting that they were foreigners and strangers on earth. They were living in stranger places. People who say such things show that they're looking for a country of their own. 
If they had been thinking of the country they had left, they would have had opportunity to return because they were familiar with the places they had been, just like you and I become familiar with things, even relationships that aren't right. We become familiar with it, we tolerate it, and it's okay. And actually, if people toss us some sympathy or in, agree with our, with our um, angle on how we're looking at things, our perspective, it's even more familiar to stay there if we had been thinking about it. Instead, the scripture says, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. And again, the theme is, faith will lead us into stranger places. And relationally speaking, faith is, is going to lead us into stranger places. But I want us to think especially about relationships today. And we think about Abel being mentioned, we go, oh yeah, Cain and Abel, bad situation. And we think about Jacob and Esau. We think about bad situation. Jacob stole the birthright and then ran and was scared to death to come back because of what he had done. And we think about Joseph and his brothers. Bad situation, right? Bad. Except for when we think about these situations from God's perspective, we think about Joseph and we think about how God permitted circumstances that, that, by the way, lasted a long time, not the months or years that we've been waiting, a long time. Circumstances that ultimately resulted in salvation, right? So I want to focus just a little bit on Abel. We're going to talk about Cain too, but if we backed up in Hebrews chapter 11 to a couple verses before that 13 through 16, it says, By faith Abel brought God a better offering than Cain did. By faith he was commended as righteous when God spoke well of his offerings. And by faith Abel still speaks even though he's dead. Let's look at the story of Cain and Abel. We're not going to spend a lot of time here. And I'm not going to talk so much about sacrifices, but I want you to see a relationship here. Okay? Brothers. And who's the, old, who's the older brother here? Who's the firstborn? It's Cain. Cain's the firstborn. All of the honor, all of the privilege, all of the, the uh, future endowments were bestowed upon the firstborn. Anyway, it says this in Genesis chapter 4, starting at the end of verse 2. Now Abel kept flocks, shepherd, and Cain worked the soil, farmer. In the course of time, Cain brought some of his fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. Just like we do. Uh, maybe you showed up today. You didn't want to be here, but you showed up as an offering to the Lord. Maybe you come on Wednesdays for prayer. Maybe you were helping out with, I don't know, technology fundraiser, uh, mechanical things, I don't know. And Abel also brought an offering, fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. So the best of the best. Or what later gets called first fruits. Not what's left over, but first fruits. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry, and his face was downcast. So sometimes we're not, we're, we're able to let it be stirring around in there, but we're able to put on a poker face. If you don't know what that is, no one can tell what cards you have. But his face was downcast. It was obvious. Some of us wear our uh, emotions on our sleeves. His emotions were on his sleeve. Then the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? Because God has a way of putting it, his finger right on exactly what's going on. 
If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. What an image. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. Now Cain said to his brother Abel, let's go out to the field. While they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. So I guess he didn't do anything about what God had put his finger on. And next thing that happened was murder. And it's shocking. And we read passages like this and we go, well, I wouldn't do that. I mean, I'm mad. I'm angry, but I'm not, I mean, I'm not that angry. I'm not inviting people out in the field. In this story, we want to be able, don't we? You want to be able? Don't want to be Cain. Let me show you something. Two photos here from uh, a celebration that happens in March of every year in, in the Jewish community. And this, this photos were actually taken from Jerusalem. And uh, the celebration is the celebration of Purim, P-U-R-I-M. And Purim is a commemoration of what happened in the book of Esther. When God, when, when uh, wicked Haman was going to destroy the Jews, and Esther was brought into a place uh, where she could speak to the king, and Mordecai was already in a place where he could talk with Esther about that and rally the people, and, and prayer would go on, and, and all of the Jews were delivered, and the bad guy got what he deserved. And by the way, these are the stories that we love. These are the stories that we want in our lives. And these are the stories where we expect God to come through. I put this up here because um, when I was in Jerusalem, we were in a courtyard, and all of a sudden all these kids came running in. They were celebrating Purim. It's kind of like a, a Halloween for them. It's costumes. But in most cases, they get to choose who they're going to be. And, and at our costume parties, you know, you get to be Superman or Batman or whoever, whatever. Um, but, but for this, when they're thinking about the book of Esther, all the girls want to be Esther. So I love that dress. You see that dress up there? That's the dress, ladies, right? Um, and if you're a guy, you want to be Mordecai. But if we're going to act it out really well, someone has to be Haman. I don't want to be Haman. Do you want to be Haman? No, I want to be Mordecai. And ladies, you want to be Esther. I'm going to turn back one slide to the Cain and Abel. And I want to just say something here that's difficult, and then we move on. Whether we think about who we would be in the Cain and Abel story, I already know we're thinking we'd be Abel. When we think of Jacob and Esau, we might not take on all the personality of a Jacob, but that's who we would be. Not selling my birthright for some porridge, stew. When we think of Joseph and his brothers, Man, I'm the one that God's going to bring out of the pit. I'm the one that's not been treated well. Maybe I've talked about dreams too much, but I'm Joseph. And I want to tell you this. I think we are quite often mistaken. Now, I don't want to drop conviction on the room. It's a great way to say, Paul, that nice seven, seri seven set series was good after two. Uh, but, but I want to tell you this. If we're real with God, boy, we've done a lot of things like Cain. In fact, on the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, if you're angry at your brother, it's tantamount to murder. If you looked on that lady with lust, it's just like... And we go, well, now, wait a minute. We think about Joseph and we think... That's who I want to be, but, but aren't we more like the person who's envious of somebody who's getting it a little bit better than we are? My mom was here last week. I wish she was here this week because I would say that of the three kids, I'm the golden boy. Maybe that's not right. 
it's the way I want it to be. And so I want us to be careful here as we think about these things. I want us to be careful. Let me share a verse with you now that brings some redemption. This is from 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And he, speaking of Jesus, died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves. And that's a message that you got loud and clear at NYC. I wish I wonder, NYC in Phoenix, I wonder if NYC is ever in NYC. Is it sometimes? Um, but anyway, um, listen, Jesus died for those that, that we should no longer live for ourselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. That's the, that's the message they shared this morning, right? I mean, we, just like Barry said, done. Except for relational issues get in our way. Sometimes with one another, mostly with God. But look at what he says, redemptively speaking, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. What does that even mean regarding people from, a, from our perspective, from our experience, from the things that we heard about that situation? From, you know, it doesn't matter if we had a hundred discussions with the person that offended us, the one discussion where they offended us was enough to negate them all. You know what I'm saying? But this says, from now on we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, and we did, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone, the new is here. Now I'm going to pause for just a second, because whether we wanted to identify with Abel in the story or not, or whether we felt convicted and went, no, 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 I guess now that I think about it, I have been like Cain, or Joseph's brothers, or Esau. I want to tell you this, your identity is in either of those. Our identity is in Christ. That's where our identity is. Thank God. Otherwise, I'm standing up here because, who knows, maybe I've got some credentials. But those are not my identity. Or maybe I'm not standing up here if you knew a lot about me because, holy cow, I've got regrets in my life. But that's not my identity. My identity is in Christ. This is the escape hatch for so many of our issues, and especially in relationships. Please, people have judged you and pegged you and labeled you. I know it, and you know it, because you've done the same thing, and so have I. Let's cut ourselves some slack and let's cut other people some slack. Could you imagine where we'd be if Jesus held our experiences against us? But the scripture says while we were yet his enemies, he died for us. That's love. That's not regarding people from a worldly perspective. Oh, we're getting into stranger places when we remember that our identity is in Christ. It's in those familiar places that we better get out because they're not enduring. Let me go a little further here. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. You know that's a gift, right? That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them, and he has committed to us the message of reconciliation, which, by the way, we often think of as, as the gospel. And yes, it is the gospel, but oh, there's so much more. The gospel is moving in relationships. It's not just bringing people to Christ, it's bringing people to Christ again. And it's running to Christ ourselves. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors. You weren't deputized in Arizona. You were deputized when you gave your life to Christ. Arizona was a reminder of your ambassadorship. 
For the rest of us, we were deputized when we gave our lives to Christ. And some of you are saying, well, I haven't made that decision yet, and I just want to invite you again. All I can do is point you to Christ. There's not much I can do for you except for to point you to Christ. But aren't you tired of that familiar place? And let, the, let today be the day of salvation. Put all your chips on the table for the hand that Christ has for you. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Which, by the way, is what was counted to Abel in his sacrifice. You know why? Because Abel, while he was taking care of the sheep, took his chips and he put them in with God. And he's commended. And today, he being dead yet speaketh. That's the King James I've been waiting for. He being dead yet speaketh. I want to return to Tom's story. Tom, who came to our Bible study for the first time a few years back, and then asked Rich and I if we, he could talk with us after. And his life had a lot of stuff in it. Tom told us that he needed to make things right with God. It was interesting. When somebody comes to talk to you, sometimes you have no idea what to expect. I had no idea what to expect. In fact, I had probably labeled Tom in some certain ways. He was a big, he was a muscular guy. He was, uh, he could play basketball and I couldn't. That's no fair. Um, I don't know. He was a business owner. Whatever. We label people, don't we? I had no idea what he was going to talk about. Tom comes and he told us he needed to make things right with God. He started with the most important relationship. He wanted to have a right relationship with God. And he did. Right there. Now, I, I mean, again, Rich, I don't know if you remember this, but I don't even know all of what was going on there. And all of a sudden, the guy, and, and a guy, you know, a, a guy's guy, all of a sudden, now he's all teary-eyed, and he's, he's telling us how God spoke to him. And I was like, cool. And he made right, things right with God. Tom next, over the course of weeks, addressed his parent situation His parents had never seen their grandsons. And at ages four and six or whatever they were at the time, I don't remember, Tom made things right with his dad and he introduced them to their grandchildren. Tom had some regretful behavior in his marriage and he picked up the book called The Love Dare. Who's, who's heard of The Love Dare before from the movie Fireproof? And he went through it, and he told us he was going through it. He didn't tell his wife. He did just like the movie. And, um, and then he did it again. And uh, the first time through, there wasn't a lot of softening in the marriage. And the second time through, not a lot of softening in the marriage. But he kept marching around Jericho. And today they have a restored, a reconciled, a healthy, not perfect, healthy marriage. I'm going to wrap here with a request. Uh, the first thing I'd like to do is get your phone. I know, it's strange, but I'm going to have you do it. And what I'd like you to do is send a text. Yes, we're going to do this now. I'm sorry. If you're just really going to do the, the, the protest of all of these things, that's fine. I'm not going to be offended. And if I am, then I'm going to run to the Lord. Anyway, I would like you to text somebody who you have seen demonstrate reconciliation. They've just been an ambassador of reconciliation. You've seen them in relationships. Take one for the team. You've seen them take the low place so something could be restored. You've seen them 
do something like Tom has. I, I, I could text, uh, and I'm going to text Tom, by the way, not right now, but I could text my friend Kevin, who I saw make things right as a business owner with another business owner he had a rift with. I could text my friend Brad, who one time when I told him I was having an issue with one of my kids said, well, you just, you just make it right. And I was like, yeah, just make it right. It's that easy. But he was right. And it was that easy. It was painful. It wasn't fair. It was being an ambassador. Text somebody that you've seen be a good example and thank them for being a godly example of an ambassador. And then the last thing I want to leave you with is this, um, and it, it should be as obvious as all get out at this point, but let today be the day that you're making relationships right. Maybe you can't make them all right. Let's start with one. Maybe you can make them all right. Let's, let's head down that road. But let's make right relationships. You can't do it in your own strength. If your hand is forming into a fist and you say, okay, then I'm really going to try now hard this time, and I've tried before and they haven't listened. Listen, you're going the wrong way. We need some Holy Ghost power. You say, Lord, I need some Holy Ghost power. It's prayer. I need Holy Ghost power to bring heaven down to earth. And that's what we're doing as ambassadors. Beth, come forward. That would be great. If, like Tom today, you've been nudged, or maybe you've been spoken to even more directly, because the passages are, in some cases, raw and direct, I want to invite you to come and pray. There's going to be a couple of us here to pray with, uh, or maybe you just want to talk about it. And I recently had a conversation with a friend of mine who had helped me one time, and he now was in his own situation. And as I said, well, my, it's the same remedy you gave to me. He was like, yeah, but my situation's different. I know, I've been there. I've thought my situation is different before too, but the remedy is still the same. The path is still the same. It's taking the low way in Holy Ghost power in the name of Jesus. And so if you'd come to like to talk about that or pray about that, I want to invite you to come forward. I'm going to step down here in just a minute and have a couple people come on. Why don't you stand up here? And, and for the rest of you, listen, make today the day that you make a relationship right or a number of relationships right. And as we're up here, um, there's going to be some more piano playing. The rest of you are going to be permitted to just head out. Lord, bless you on your day today. Remember, we're here for a short amount of time. Let's make it count in the power of the Holy Ghost.